Okay. Okay, finally, let us go through uh, one seventh basis of comment. Broadly speaking, there seems to be two classes of cases in which comment is permissible. One, those in which the public interest arises out of the subject matter itself, and two, those in which the complaining party has himself invited comment from the public. Okay. All right, so we will pause there for now. And let's see. Pause there, we will be right back. Subsection, subsection, one, matters of public interest. Matters of state and judicial proceedings. 22 to 171. Everything which directly affects the welfare of church and state is clearly a matter of general public interest. There can be no dispute as to the right of discussion with regard to the policy of the government, the proceedings of the legislature, the conduct of the executive in civil and military affairs, and generally the manner in which all those who may be called public servants discharge their duties. Point 826 The administration of justice is also without doubt a matter of public interest and therefore susceptible to public comment. Point 827 Public and local administration 22 to 172 There are many matters which might at first sight seem purely local in their bearing, but which, nevertheless, are considered of interest to the nation at large as being parts of a general system. Many important branches of government are exercised by local authorities, and the conduct of these authorities in exercising their public functions can be commented upon. Point 828 in Kelly v. Tinling 829 It was held to be a matter of general public importance to discuss the precise manner in which worship was carried on in a particular church. Point 830 On the same principle it would probably be held that the affairs of any institution in the administration of which the state had any voice, such as for example one of that numerous class under the control of the charity commissioners, are matters of general public interest. Institutions free from public control. 22 to 173. Importance, were once considered institutions which are entirely 22 institutions free from public control. 22 to 173. Institutions which are entirely in private hands, whatever their importance, were once considered to be not properly the subject of discussion by the world at large, unless indeed the support or intervention of the public was in some way invited. Point 831 in Gathair Coley v. Me all 832 the claimant clergyman was attacked in the defendant's newspaper for the way in which the society was managed. The court held that there was no right of comment on the matter, not because the society was merely of local importance but because it was entirely private and voluntary. In the case of South Head and Cole Covey Northeastern News Association 833 however, the Court of Appeal took a wider view than that in the previously decided cases. They thought that the conduct of a private business, if sufficiently large and relating to a sufficiently large number of persons, was a matter of public interest and might be commented on as such. The Claimants were colliery proprietors who sued the defendant newspaper in respect of allegations relating to the sanitary condition of cottages, let by the claimants to their employees in a village with a population of 2,000. The court stated that the sanitary condition of these cottages was capable of being a matter of public interest. That expression of opinion was not strictly necessary to the decision, 
the jury having found page 147 that the defendants had exceeded the limits of fair comment nevertheless this case was cited with approval by the court of appeal in london artists ltd v littler 834 where it held that it was a matter of public interest that four prominent performers had all given notice at the same time that they were leaving a theatrical production thus putting a successful play in peril 826 seymour v butterworth 1862 All right. Let's just take a look at that. Let's just take a look at the notes. Okay. There's no qualified privilege for an inaccurate or defamatory report of judicial proceedings. Okay. Administration of poor laws, including the conduct of medical officers, is a matter of public interest. Administration of poor laws, including the conduct of medical officers, is a matter of public interest. Very interesting. In which C. Walker versus Brockden and Gaskell versus Mion. In which case the court was equally divided as to the right of discussion, the right of discussing the clergyman sermon. By advertisement when conducting a mail order business. Okay. As to the conduct of as to the conduct. Okay, as to the conduct and right. See Lord Denning, MR, definitions of a matter of public interest, Act 391, such as to affect people at large so that they may be legitimately interested in or concerned at what is going on or what may happen to them or others. Okay, below is I mean, such as such as to affect people at large so that they may be legitimately interested or concerned that what is going on or what may happen to them or to others. So that is Lord Denning MR's definition of a matter of public interest, something that affects people at large so that they may be legitimately interested in or concerned at what is going on or what may happen to them or others. Okay, let's see. I think we can do 174, 175. Maybe even 176 and 177. Okay, let's try it. Let's see, 174. Okay, 174 to 175.
All right, let's just do 174 to 175. One seventy four to one seventy five. Okay, so literary and artistic criticism, the true ground on which that special kind of comment known generally as criticism seems to rest. The true ground on which that special kind of comment known generally as criticism seems to rest is that a person who appeals to the public and to the public must be judged by the public. The true ground on which that special kind of comment known, as, known generally as criticism seems to rest is that a person who appeals to the public must be judged by the public. Every man says Lord Ellenborough in a well-known passage who publishes a book, commits himself to the judgment of the public, and anyone may comment upon his performance. If the commentator does not step aside from the work or introduce, introduce fiction for the purpose of condemnation, he exercises a fair and legitimate right. This right has been so universally accepted that before the decision in Maryville v. Carson, the law of literary and artistic criticism had been nowhere fully discussed. There is no doubt, however, that every species of literary production down to a newspaper is fair game. There's no doubt, however, that every species of literary production down to a newspaper is fair game for the critic and even the handbill of an advertising tradesman has been dealt with on the same principle. Works of art, at a public exhibition, public performances, both musical and dramatic, have to undergo the ordeal of public judgment, whether expressed through the press or in the case of the latter by the immediate applause or censure of the audience. A criticism submitted to the public is itself a subject of criticism. Okay, so the criticism itself is the subject of criticism. Now, let us appeals to the public. Appeals of every kind to the press are constantly made to the public intelligence, the public conscience, and the public pocket. Whatever the nature of these appeals or the position of those who make them, discussion is clearly invited, and that discussion is free. It may be, be, it may be the promulgation of a quark remedy or a scheme for the suppression of quark. There have been proposals to convert the whole of China to Christianity or to convert England wholesale to Republicanism. All such campaigns and enthusiasm are open to legitimate criticism, comment, and discussion. Let's see if there's anything in the notes. Or criticism is find a particular issue or deals with the way in which it is in general conducted. Malice. Let me deal with malice. Relevance of malice. Malice, when considered in the context of the defense of fair comment, effectively means that the defendant did not honestly believe in the opinion he was expressing. Malice, when considered in the context of defense of fair comment, effectively means that the defendant did not honestly believe in the opinion he was expressing. Okay. Unlike malice in other contexts, an improper motive for publishing a defamatory opinion will not amount to malice if the defendant honestly believes the opinion. The burden of proof in respect of malice lies on the claimant. It follows that where the defendant satisfies the above four tests, there is no added burden on him to prove that he did in fact honestly hold the opinion in question. It will be for the claimant if he chooses to raise the issue of whether the opinion was honestly held by alleging malice. It is very rare for malice to be proved in common cases. Before the issue arises, the defendant will already have had to persuade the jury that the facts on which the comment is based are true or sufficiently true, 
and that the comment was objectively fair. If that is the case, it will be very difficult to show that the comment, which after all is a subjective matter, was not the honest expression of the author's opinion. The province of judge and jury. I think we could do this too. Province of judge and jury in common with other areas of defamation law, the judge has the power to determine summarily a fair comment defense or part of it, where either party has no realistic prospect of success. The judge can ask, for example, whether the issue is so clear cut that no reasonable jury could disagree with him. This most commonly arises in relation to whether the words are fact or comment, because it is a determination that involves no evidence. There are recent examples of judges striking our defenses on the basis ruling that the words are clearly common. In the last case, the judge can go on to decide that the other aspects of the defense are so clearly made out that no reasonable jury could conclude otherwise. This will often depend on the extent to which what in fact. If the judge rules that it would have clearly fair comment, the only remaining is to be malice if it is raised where there is no in favor of the defendant. Where both sides have a realistic prospect of success, the claim should proceed to concerning fair comment are treated as questions of fact for the jury, apart from whether the subject matter of the comment is a matter of public interest. In rare cases, in which this is an issue, it is treated as a question of law for the judge. Specifying the meaning to be defended. The practice direction 2.53 of the civil procedure rule, civil proceeding rule, uh, provides that. Okay. The practice, let's do that again, specifying the meaning to be defended. The practice direction to point 53 of the civil procedure rules provides that where a defendant alleges that the words complained of are fair comments on a matter of public interest, he must specify the defamatory meaning he seeks to defend as fair comment on a matter of public interest and give details of the matters on which he relies in support of that allegation. The note to this paragraph of the practice direction in the white book comments that the defendant is now obliged as with justification to set out the meaning which he seeks to defend as fair comment rather than the course often adopted of merely identifying the words in the publication which will be defended as comment. Okay, let's just take a look at some notes. The rule is said to stem from the decision in control risk versus New English Library. The precise effect of which has been the subject of some controversy among practitioners. The debate has been over whether there is a requirement to set out the precise meaning of the word said to be common, or merely to identify which word will be defended as fair comment. The note says that the latter approach has prevailed under the practice direction, but it may be that the courts take a liberal view of practitioners adopting the former approach. It is statutory basis. Is the next item. Do we have time for that, or are we going to stop there? I think we'll stop there. All right, we'll stop right there on statutory basis at 1.79. Okay, so when we resume. All right, so when we resume next class, we will continue from.
statutory basis. Um, we are looking at this is subsection e, secondary responsibilities, section one of the definition, huh? 1996, statutory basis 22179. Okay, so join us then. We're taking, we're continuing from statutory basis 22179. Right. Bye bye. Okay.